like to say uh, good morning, Borodar Akraiso. Good morning and welcome. And thank you for joining us this morning at the launch of our Good Practice Guide on understanding the welfare impa impact of the police crime and police crime sentencing and courts act gosh that's so much easier to say the police act which i'll say from now on in um, so i'm alison humes and i'm the national director for wales of the british association of social workers and along with my colleagues jackie bolton and doreen dove i'm one of the founder members of the gypsy roma and traveler social work association uh, you'll be hearing from some of my colleagues a, a little later on but if those of you that are here can introduce yourselves so do you want to turn off your uh, pup, put on your microphones and say hello. Shall I go first, Alison? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Jackie Bolton. As Alison just said, I'm also one of the co-founders of the Gypsy Roma Travellers Social Work Association. I'm a traveller with uh, show people and Romany Gypsy background. I've travelled my whole life and um, in adulthood, sort of only in the last 10 or 15 years, I qualified as a social worker. And um, after a call out from Alison, we got together with a few colleagues and formed the GRT Social Work Association. And we've been working as activists in the field of social work to lobby for reform and better practice in the field of social work for, well, it feels like a long time, but I think it's coming up for two or three years. In a pandemic, you lose all sense of time. Um, but latterly, we've been working on this piece of work with colleagues in the professions and allies. So it's good to be here today. Thank you. Um, Jan? I, uh, I'm Jan Weiss, I'm a consultant social worker in East Batal, but I'm currently looking after ah, my daughter's yeah. dog, <laughs> who thinks it's a parrot. Um, I've had an interest in the rights of gypsy travellers for a, a number of years now, about 10 years, and a, a lot of that has been trying to promote better understanding practice within local authorities, and currently with East Batal, but, um social services. And we've got a, a, a working party that's trying to improve um, the, the, the access to service and, and, and support for our, our uh, community. We, we've got about 250 uh, gypsy travellers who are resident in East Patal. But... Thank you. Is Martin there? Martin, can you introduce yourself? Yes? No? I think Martin's frozen for a while. Is he? Okay. Um, shall we go to Chris? Morning, all. Um, my name's Chris. I'm a social worker based in Wiltshire in child protection. And prior to that, I spent a long time um, in youth work working with Gypsy Roma Traveller communities. So um, it's been a pleasure as an ally to be part of this group over the last couple of years. Thanks, Chris. And I think last but not least, Dan. Good morning, everybody. Dan Allen. Um, I'm a social worker, practitioner and academic uh, work at Manchester Metropolitan University. And I've been an uh, honoured member of the G2 Roma Travel Social Work Association um, as, a, as a key ally. Thank you. Oh, on mute. Al, you're on mute. It's bound to happen, wasn't it? Thanks, Narinda. So our, our good practice guidance, which is accompanied by a part A and a part B, part B welfare inquiry form, has been developed in partnership with Dr. Dan Allen, who just introduced himself uh, at Manchester Metropolitan University, the Gypsy Roma Traveller Social Work Association and the British Association of Social Workers. We are also really grateful to our colleagues, Trudy Aspinwall from Travelling Ahead, and I know that Trudy's on the call this morning, um, uh, Travelling Ahead is an all Wales advocacy project which supports Gypsy Roma and Traveller people in Wales. Uh, to Mark Willis QC from Garden Court Chambers and to Chris Johnson from the Community Law Partnership who took the time to review our guidance and whose feedback and endorsement has been invaluable. So Diochen Vauriaun, thank you very much to them. So why did we develop this guidance and who is it for? 
we're all too aware that the Police Act, which so many of us campaigned vigorously against, is now law. And in the last three weeks that the Act has been implemented, we've already seen enforcement action taking place, an enforcement action which appears to have included a disproportionate response by the police. This is what we most feared happening. Also, in our written evidence on the impact of the police bill, as it was then, to Westminster and Welsh governments, the Gypsy Roman Traveller Social Work Association raised our real concerns that enforcement action could result in more Gypsy and Traveller children being referred to child welfare services and, being and becoming looked after by the state. We already know from, from Dr Allen's research, published earlier this year in the British Journal of Social Work, that Gypsy Traveller and Roma children are disproportionately referred into child welfare services and are overrepresented in state care. As members of the Gypsy Roman Traveller Social Work Association, who are ethnic gypsies and travellers, this law is aimed at eradicating who we are. It is social engineering of the most grotesque form, designed for our ethnic cleansing, and we did not form as an association to be passive in the face of this state brutality and assault on our human rights. Our efforts must now be turned to mitigating the impact of the Police Act on nomadic families, whether they are nomadic because of ethnicity or culture or for employment purposes, and whose encampment meets the conditions for initiating the new police powers under the Act. Although police guidance on managing and authorised encampments has been published, we believe that the inherent values and ethics in our good practice guidance, which absolutely gold plates human rights and equality act legislation and is anti-racist, strengths based and family focused, will be viewed by those police forces who choose to adopt a welfare and not an enforcement approach as an opportunity for them to take some learning to inform their and, and to inform their practice. So this good practice guidance and welfare inquiry reforms are aimed at local authorities and any other organisations who will be tasked with undertaking welfare assessments on unauthorised encampments, some of whom will be social workers. The Good Practice Guide provides a brief introduction to the types of conversations that can lead to a reliable and verifiable understanding of the welfare considerations that result from police action. This information may then be used to support a legal challenge or appeal against the Police Act on the grounds that the act of eviction is incompatible with the Human Rights Act in Wales and England. We will be piloting the, gui the guidance in Wales and England and our best hope is that it will become the standard one. Um, so I'm now going to hand over to Dan to see if he wants to say anything further about the good practice guidance and uh, we've got a, a, a PowerPoint to share with you um, which the rest of the group will will now speak to. So if we could if you could put the, the PowerPoint up Helen and Dan do you want to say any more there about the just, just very briefly I think that was a fantastic uh, introduction and summing up the the, 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 collab the collaboration effort um, required to consider best practice in terms of welfare impact and welfare inquiry was quite a challenging um, job to do because we're aware that there's a disproportionate representation of gypsy Roman traveller children in contact with child welfare services in the way that Alison has just explained. And what we didn't want was a welfare inquiry that could necessarily um, bring um, gypsy shown to the child community more specifically into the multi-agency safeguarding hub. We know that there's a systematic issue in that those multi-agency safeguarding hubs deal with individuals rather than families and highlighting any concern in relation to a child's welfare or uh, mental health or in enjoying difficulties associated to age and disability. Um, was, was, was a key concern for us and that we didn't want the necessary legal duty to carry out a welfare inquiry alongside the application of the impact to exacerbate an already difficult problem. So hopefully through the duration of this presentation, you're going to hear from some fabulous colleagues who have been really key and instrumental into de in developing the tone of this, this work that there's a real need to highlight the importance of gypsy, showman and traveller centred social work practice. And therefore this welfare inquiry form represents the strengths based perspectives that support a pro gypsy, showman and traveller perspective to highlight that it is the police action that causes the welfare concern 
not any deficits that may be projected or stereotypically applied to the community. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Helen, could we move the slide, please? So um, in, in this presentation, we'll be doing a bit more context setting around the, the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Act, and then we'll go into uh, a deeper dive of the uh, welfare inquiry form that we've developed, and then we'll have some opportunity at the end. Well, we've got some questions to pose to you, uh, which, which we hope you'll be able to answer, but also the opportunity for you to ask questions. So if you please put them into the chat box so that we can keep monitoring, but there will be time at the end for us to take questions. So if we move to the next. And the next on Helen. So Jackie, are you going to come in here? Thanks, Alison and Dan. That was a, a fabulous introduction and setting the scene for, for this new um, legislation that we're facing in our communities. And I'm sure everyone on the call knows the plethora of legislation that our communities have faced ever since we came to this country. But um, I've certainly traced my family history back to the 1700s, but History shows we came here in the 1500s. And ever since we landed, legislation's been used to control what we do. But history shows we've always been nomadic and many of us still are. And if we're not, we still want to be. And if we're not able to, we suffer for it physically and mentally. And there's lots of studies historically and still going on that show the stresses and strains of our lack of ability to be nomadic has on us. So we all know that there's a lack of legal places to stop. Even if you buy your own place, you can't get planning permission. My mum's got her own bungalow now, but even opposite where she lives, a traveling man bought a piece of land and applied for stables on it and 78 people applied um, in opposition to the stables on the basis that they expected it, that he was going to try and get permission to live on there. And um, a permanent injunction has been put on there that no travellers, tra caravans can go on. So that's just on what might happen because the, the owner is a traveller. <clears throat> so that wouldn't happen to any other community. So it's complete draconian response to an ethnic minor minority. So even though, though legislation exists for you to supposedly provide your own site, the response to you when you try to do this is over the top. So what happens is that there are still people who have nowhere legally to park there trailer and this includes showmen we often talk about gypsies and travelers but there's plenty of showmen who've got nowhere to legally stop and they're also crowded out in their yards especially in London there's pressure their yards are being compulsory purchased <coughs> excuse me my own family's yard was compulsory purchased in the 1980s in Stonebridge Park Brent and the people, my cousins, still have got nowhere legal, legal to park in the winter. And um, showmen are afraid what's going to happen to them under this new legislation in between fairs, because fairs don't happen every day of the week, and showmen pull up in between fairs uh, while they're waiting for the next fair, especially in the towns. Um, the way that we are often forced to use unauthor unauthorised, so-called unauthorised camping, means that that has an effect on us. Countless studies have shown this, and I worked with um, Patrice Van Klimpert in the seminal study in 2004. The evidence is all there and nothing is changing. We're still fighting for spaces. So um, this act is where are the people going to go? Where are we going to go? You don't disappear in a puff of smoke. And uh, my MP actually is Matt Hancock. 
and I wrote to him complaining about this act and when it was proposed as a bill and all he replied, he do actually reply because my address is a farm and he must think I'm a Tory voter. And he said um, it was in our manifesto. So it's in the manifesto. So therefore they've got a mandate to do it and they're pressing ahead. So the impacts on our health, physical and mental and all our other outcomes are deplorable, but still the march goes on. So could we have a look at the next um, slide, please? So as Dan touched upon, we did make a submission. We responded to the consultation, but the bill still came into being and is now law. So the next step is we are continuing to press for action and stressing the need for proper welfare inquiries. We all know up until now that the welfare inquiries in most local authorities protocols, it's a tick box exercise. Is anybody expecting anybody had a baby, anybody um, critically ill, dying? and so on. It's very superficial. So it's, it's in law that welfare inquiries, inquir I can't even talk this morning, um, that they have to be made, but they're not really done by a qualified person. They might be done by the local authority, um, lia traveller liaison officer, but it's quite um, cursory one might say that would be my argument so it's required to be done but we're trying to stress that it needs to be done properly and we've produced this good practice guidance in the spirit of helpfulness and the urgency now with the consequences that can occur with our children being removed possibly into care and all the negative consequences that can occur through the care system, it's just critical that good practice guidance is followed. And we're looking for advocates through the people on this call and also through national and local organisations to cascade the guidance that we've produced to make sure, like Dan said, that these inquiries are done through a strengths perspective not a deficit perspective of what is wrong with you, but how have you coped before? What are your strengths? So we know that the police should ensure that wider equalities and human rights and welfare inquiries are made, but it's the quality of how that's done. So we want to make sure that that's done well before anybody's evicted and before anybody's arrested, fined, all their trailers and homes are impounded and took away from them. Can we have the next slide, please? <clears throat> I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Chris, who just introduced himself a minute ago, because he's been instrumental, like the rest of the team, in developing this guidance. And he has um, completed some of these inquiries already and been training his team where he works in Wiltshire and he's going to talk you through our form, our forms uh, themselves. So they're broken down into part A and B and he's going to go through the detail. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks Jackie, that's really helpful. Um, we want to recognise that, that welfare assessments have got all kinds of different levels. And we want to recognise that often um, families will often feel the pressure to move on. And so even if the family plan to move on because they don't want to have that conflict with the police, they don't want to risk all of the consequences that, that Jackie's so clearly spoken about, we would encourage you to ensure that a part A form is completed. And it's just to help understand why the family are residing on an unauthorised encampment and it helps build some of that picture around data in terms of understanding what are the issues, understanding um, whether or not they are looking for other accommodation, 
and understanding what needs to, to be the next step. So we feel that, that this is a, a really simple form where even if someone's agreed, okay, we're going to move in 24, 48 hours, the police and the landowner are happy, this is a way of compiling some of the information. I've not put on the slide the, the kind of basic name, date of birth, all that kind of stuff. You can see that in the pack um, that's been sent. Now, when we sit there and see that that's not quite working, we're going to move on to a part B form, which is the next slide. Um, we're really conscious that there will be times when the police will need to take action under the Police Act. And that will cause significant welfare considerations. And so part B is a much more detailed conversation, trying to bring in the range of legislation across health and social care that really tries to understand what the needs are. It's gathering that important information, it's analysing those needs, it's deciding whether or not action under the police act would breach those equality and those human rights law and it's identifying the support it's very evidence-based and it's very focused on what are the next steps so it should be something that should be really easy and um, for a wide range of different practitioners so it could be a gp a family support worker a school nurse teacher a community advocate um, a religious leader, all kinds of different groups should be able to do this. Um, and if we move on to the next slide, I'm just going to show you through some of the different information that, that you'll be compiling as part of that. So the first bit is really focusing on what are the existing support networks. We know that families have really strong support networks and so we want to recognise and understand what those are. And we want to understand what the situation is for the family. Often we know that they are on waiting lists for sites. They're on waiting lists for permanent pitches and other kind of areas. And so we want to, to be able to understand that. We need to understand what are the needs for any children and understanding how does they um, their welfare be impacted by any potential eviction. If we move on to the next slide. And as part of that, we need to explore what that looks like for the parent. There are real challenges around trying to manage being a parent whilst having police trying to evict you and trying to deal with all the other daily issues, the racism, the forms of abuse that happen so many times for nomadic communities. And after that, we move on to explore some of the care needs for the family, understanding and trying to really clearly recognise whether or not there are specific care needs that need to be looked at. And then similarly, the, the next slide goes on to look at mental health and trying to ascertain what are the concerns around someone's specific mental health needs. But also, as we see in the next slide, looking at when have been moments where their treatment has worked, when have there been moments where actually things feel helpful. And we understand that um, psychologically, we know that evictions, research has shown us that evictions is awful for people's mental health. We need to acknowledge whether or not there are a care of responsibilities within the group outside of the, the biological care for children. And so looking at that wider kinship community and understanding what is happening there in terms of those kinship needs. And all of that brings us to the next point, which is the key aspect of the, the document in many ways. So section, uh, the next slide, please. So it's this summary of discussion and it's about trying to have an agreed summary of discussion. So this is something that the family should own. It's something that the family should be in full agreement with what is written in this document. So we need to be really clear. What is it that they and we are worried about? What is it that's working well and what needs to happen? And understanding that within the context of potential police action and being able to scale what the impact looks like. Is that impact really significant? Is that going to have real risks for that family, for those children? 
or is it something that has some aspects of risk but is more straightforward for that family and so it's being able to really clearly identify those different risks those different concerns and those different strengths so there's a real overview of what this potential police action has as an impact for this family and then that leads us on to to the conclusion of the welfare form so hopefully by then you've got really detailed understanding of this family you've got an understanding of their makeup you've got an understanding of their needs across education across health across social care a number of different areas and so you should be able to analyze then what is the impact of potential police involvement so what what's that going to do for those individuals for that family for that community and how's that then going to lead to some immediate actions what things do we need to do to make sure that we're moving forward so it might be signposting to a relevant agency it might be liaising over provision of um, essentials around toilet use and water and other kind of areas and so it's then really key that this action plan is agreed who is going to do what and being really clear about that so that everybody is aware and for me this is where it's about that relationship with the landowner with the police around being able to evidence really clearly what is happening and at that point that then gives a much stronger opportunity for the police to delay action and to challenge landowners now this welfare sort of document is based on a number of different areas so we've included stuff from the children's act 1989 the care act 2014 the equality act the mental capacity act mental health act social services and well-being wales act human rights act data protection act the the working together to safeguard children guidance the the signs of safety model from from andrew turnell and steve edwards the um, department of health common assessment frameworks uh, united nations convention on the rights of the children the the child and young persons wales measure and a whole load of wider homelessness law and policy so it's based on those assessments that will be happening in other statutory areas but this is only a tool and the the key is going to be how do you do that how do you have those conversations because if we have that in a antagonistic kind of conflict way then actually it's just going to become a a kind of very um crisis driven conversation but actually there are ways in which we can manage both the the, the police the needs of the family and other agencies to actually have quite a reasonable um tool to be able to evidence um, and make a much more sensible decision so i'm just going to pass back to to jackie to reflect a bit about how might you do that thanks chris that's a, a very good look at the forms themselves and as you've touched on uh, there are ways and means of doing things so in our guidance when you receive it you'll see that we talk about values a value system now it, within social work we we uh, build our practice upon our values and um, we would stress that when undertaking a welfare assessment that the individuals show high levels of sensitivity and empathy having been evicted there's nothing like it if you've seen films if you've been there you'll know what it's like if you're on the fringes you're scared for your home scared for your children scared for your life and um, no matter how many times it happens to you it's still traumatizing and one of the worst things that can happen because you you do not know where you're going next so um the conducting of the assessment might actually happen whilst an eviction is threatened or being um 
prepared for. You know, one family member might be input into the assessment while another one's coupling up the trailer and pulling up the jacks and packing everything on the van. So it's a highly emotionally charged situation. So to be sensitive to people who are trying to look around and see what's going on and bailiffs can be brutal and insensitive. So um, you need to show high levels of sensitivity. And um, the person-centered approach, which we use a lot in social work, which is what, what's the situation like for the person? Don't ever say, I know what it's like myself, because you don't. It's the person's um, experience and everything has to be led by them, how they want the, assist, uh, the assessment to work. And it's all about building up that relationship, not just uh, breezing in, I want to fill a form in, I need to tick the box, I want to fill it in at such and such a time. Trust needs to be built with traveling communities. Those, I'm probably preaching to the converted, but a good relationship is uh, crucial. And some of this information, especially on Form B, is very personal, sensitive, and even there are taboos around mental health because we don't tend to share that with everyone. So possibly a number of visits will be required. And um, if you have an existing relationships with people, it's going to be easier to build this or perhaps fill it in over a number of visits where you build trust and uh, if you have time. And the other value is about anti-oppressive practice. And um, I mean, we'd need another two hour session or a whole day to talk about anti-oppressive practice. but. Um, to not impose your systems um, and to understand how written information for people who don't read is oppressive, jargon is oppressive, having appointment times for people who don't have clocks is oppressive. A whole lot of things can be oppressive to travellers that you might not necessarily think about. But the more you get to work with travellers, the more you understand what they are. And basically to empower and enable people to resolve situations themselves, rather than telling them what to do and disempowering them. I mean, the whole process of evictions and moving people on is disempowerment and disabling in a nutshell. So to conduct the welfare inquiries and empower and enable the person will help to mitigate the trauma of the eviction. And sometimes an assessment can be an intervention itself because somebody is listened to and they can understand more what's going on in their family and seek assistance accordingly. Can we have the next slide, please? So top tips, um, we talked about person-centred, but also about action and outcomes. We don't like talking for its sake. And there's been a lot of um, research done onto travelling communities, and we are all researched out. We will talk if something will happen on the back of it, even if it's something small. And um, if something can happen, even if it, you're signposted somewhere else or you get a phone call, a number for legal assistance, but some outcome, however small. But the focus needs to be on what change can happen for that family. And then holistic in approach. So the wider, picture the whole family what is the situation for the family and not just narrow focus so not just that eviction at that moment in time but the, the whole family what's going to happen next and their their life cycle um 
how can you impact on improving that for everybody? And preferably involving the children. Children's voices are seldom heard. I've seen films of eviction where children are obviously highly traumatised and no regard is taken from a safeguarding perspective for any of those children, either to keep them away from diggers, JCBs, cranes, the risks of fires or anything. If that was an emergency in any other public space, the children would be taken from that place to a place of safety. But I've seen all sorts of risk to children completely disregarded because they're traveller children and it's unacceptable and for children's voices to be heard is very important because that's a trauma-informed approach you you may not be able to stop the eviction but if the children can express their emotions and be heard that will be a mitigating factor in itself and we've got children our children are ending their own lives Younger and younger, I heard of a nine-year-old child ending their own life. They're ending their lives at 12 years old. Whatever is going on to oppress and traumatise our children that they're ending their own lives. You never had anything like it in my life. It's got to stop. I talked a little bit ago about risks. You need to help identify the risks for the family because... To be honest, we do get a little bit immune to the risks that we're facing because you've grown up with it. And um, you families might need support to identify and mitigate risks. And um, that's something that would be a good tip for, for helping on the welfare assessment. But building on the strengths, it's not all about risk because we do now have a lot of us know how to manage risk um, and don't make it all doom and gloom by focusing on the, the problems and the difficulties and the challenges. And uh, just focus on positive action. What we're going to do, what's going to happen next, how can we make things better? And the other one is about transparency. Just be clear who you are, what you can do. Don't promise um, the earth that you can't change the law what's going to happen is going to happen if they're going to be evicted if they got to leave at 12 o'clock they got to get off by 12 but try and do what you can before then and um, preventative try to stop the worst happening but as I mentioned before if they've got to go at 12 they have to go but keep a contact so that you can help work with the family to reduce harm in the future can we have the next slide please Going on for, for further tips, uh, we're talking about, I mean, the, the word assessment, my colleague Martin, he keeps getting knocked off the call, but assessment is a scary word and it, it's a bit of a judgy word. And if somebody says I'm going to do an assessment, that's scary. That's why we've called this a welfare inquiry. Uh, but it's a conversation really. You're having a conversation about understanding what welfare considerations exist in the family. So to make that a high quality conversation, we hate to say it, but no, no offense to the people on this um, conference call, but for, for other people who might need reminding, Gypsy, Roma, Traveller, Showman, all of us are human beings and we need to be treated with respect and dignity. Even when things, emotions are high, if the eviction's at 12 and it's 5 to 12, we're still human beings. And um, to be honest, as I mentioned before, don't promise something you can't deliver. Be honest about what's going on and role model the best behaviour. Um, there's no point being offensive and um, having a go at the bailiffs, which I would be tempted to do. You have to be calm and collected yourselves and role model that good behaviour and not blame. The, the, uh, the situation is as it is. The law has come into force 
and listen and be inclusive to everyone involved. And to be an advocate for the family, advocate for that family's rights. Our rights are under threat. Everybody's rights will be under threat if the Human Rights Act is cast aside. And as mentioned before by Alison and Dan, the strengths, promote our strengths. We have got significant strengths. We've been legislated against ever since we came to these countries and we've managed to pull through ever since. So we have got strengths and we will continue to have them, but let's promote them and work together. Um, and it's about making change. The act has come into being, but together we can present test cases. And I know that um, the Community Law Partnership are looking for test cases. And we hope that through these welfare inquiries, that that will provide um, fodder for court cases to challenge unfair evictions and welfare rights that have been breached. Um, but it's also about challenging yourself and others to recognise what uh, could have been done better and how other people's practice could have been improved through continuous learning and reflecting back about um, how things could be done better in future and also keeping yourself safe. Evictions and traumatic events like this take a toll on people. And if you're conducting welfare assessments in, in this situation, it's going to have an emotional toll. So do seek good supervision. We've put this in our guidance. Seek support from colleagues and your um, managers because um, the law exists. We can't change it. It's frustrating and it's awful. So do look after yourselves. And um, I touched on supervision, but debrief afterwards, talk to somebody, talk about what's happened and keep learning and keep safe and um, just, just keep going. I'm gonna hand over now. I think that's my last slide, but thanks for listening to those tips. We've got more detail and I'm sure that other people as they start using these forms will come up with more tips and this is going to be an iterative process we don't claim to be geniuses or this is our first draft so um, we we're not the last word on everything we want everybody to help and as I said before work together so thanks everyone for listening again and we're, we're going to have questions and discussions now Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jackie, Chris and Dan for that excellent walk through the, um, the part A and the part B uh, welfare um, inquiry forms. Um, <laughs> we were all involved in developing it, but it's just you just made it come to life, which is really fantastic. So so thank you. I mean, we do have some questions to, to pose now. Um, and I, and I think if everyone's comfortable, uh, if you could open up your your microphones and your cameras, so we could have a bit of a discussion. So the questions we've got are, you know, what, so what, what are your what are your thoughts on on what you've seen? Um, what do you think would be the biggest challenges in using these inquiry proformers? What do you think we need to do differently? And are there any organisations you would like? To is there, is there anyone in your organisation that you would like us to speak to in order to implement this good practice guidance and the, the, the welfare inquiries? And, and I do wonder, should we just um, show the good practice guidance so that people can, can just see what it looks like? Is it, have you got that to upload? Could we put the questions in the chat? And then maybe we could put the good practice guidance up so that people can see what it looks like. Is that okay, Narinda or Helen? Uh, yeah, I'll go and uh, try and get a copy and uh, share it on screen. One second. Thank you. Good practice guidance. Narinda, are you able to put the questions into the chat? 
can everyone see that is that the guide that you wanted up Alison that's yeah that's perfect that's brilliant yeah I think it always helps if you can actually you can actually see it um if you can you scroll down yeah keep going uh, okay if you stop there a second so um we were really grateful to have um a forward written by uh Chris Johnson from Community Law um Partnership and I think um I mean the the, the final sentence sentence really um you know, saying that that they really welcome the excellent guidance and and they will doubtless be quoting from it um which is which is really fantastic quoting from it extensively which um we're really we were really happy to receive that that endorsement uh, if you can go down helen yeah keep going so yeah if you just stop there so so the contents are the introduction the the welfare inquiry forms which which chris and 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 Jackie have have walked you through so brilliantly and then we've got some sort of practical you know it's a, it's a toolkit so some very practical support then and, and how you undertake you know those important conversations that Jackie talked about this is a conversation these are strengths based you know anti-oppressive family focused conversations uh, and we've also you know we've got references to the laws and the policies that informed the development of this this good practice guidance if you can go down to almost to the end Helen yeah keep going keep going <laughs> I'll be there in a minute I'll do that oh okay that's, okay that's go, go back up a bit go back up so up again up 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 so so if you just stop there where you've got the the that does it so we've got um Again, some some support on how you undertake a risk assessment using the signs of safety model, and I think Chris referred to the signs of safety model. And if you just scroll down a little bit till we get to the and the, the signs of safety model, you, they use uh, three houses so that children can think about you know what they're worried about, you know what what what's going really well and what their kind of best hopes are. And that that house model was adapted by some of you may may know Mickey Ridge, who you know sadly has has, has passed, but Mickey Ridge uh, adapted that specifically you know for for Gypsy and Traveller children so that it, it it was meaningful and it had relevance. So you know we were really happy to 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 use um the trailers as adapted by mickey can you can you go up helen please okay yeah a, a, a little bit more to the next page so um if you can stop that so um you know chris and jackie also talked about you know the 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 importance of understanding you know family connections and when you're taking a strengths based approach you know that's what we need to understand who is in the family and how do they support one another and what what are their key roles in the family so again we've given some examples of how you undertake i mean in social work terms we call it a, 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 a genogram or an ecogram but again, very practical um, support in, in, in how that would be undertaken. So um, as well as kind of referencing, you know, the, the, the law and the policy, it's very much a practical tool that gives you, you know, examples on, on how to, to actually undertake, you know, those conversations and how to undertake those risk assessments and how to undertake um, a family connection um, model or ecogram. So shall we open up for um, questions? So if you've got any questions as well on the on the good practice guide itself or those questions that, that we've posed. So let's go back to the questions. Are they in the chat now? So question one, what do you like about the inquiry pro formas? What would be the biggest challenge when using them? Uh, what what do you think we need to do differently? And is there anyone in your organizational region that you think we should be speaking to? Is everyone happy to open up their, their microphones and their cameras? 
Um, so, so someone's Jim, Marcus Jim put... his hand raised, Alison. So I'll just Sorry. Oh, you. Jim. Hi, Jim. Hey, Alison. How are you doing? Good. Yeah. Nice to see you. Yeah, you too. Nice to see everyone else as well. This is brilliant, isn't it? This is so much stuff to think about here and so many questions I've got to ask and so many things to think about. For the first question, what I like about the, the form is, is a bit of a paradox, really. I like the fact that you've used the legislation. I think Chris alluded to that. And in there, you've got significant harm, which means different things to different social workers and different practitioners. You know, Children's Act, it means different to someone in mental health. Now, I like that, but I also understand that that can cause difficulties. I think Dan alluded to that at the beginning, saying as soon as you introduce those sort of concepts, then the, the risk threshold kicks in and people start to think, oh, actually, do I need to be doing something that might dictate me to do something in terms of enforcement, like, you know, referring to children's services, et cetera, et cetera. And we know all of the poor outcomes looked after children or in mental health, referring to a mental health act assessment and all that comes along with that with detention. So I'm not, you know, I like, I do like the use of that in there, but I also appreciate what Dan said. We really do need to keep that in focus that we don't want to tip this from something that's supposed to be helping people into something that makes things worse for them. Um, so that, that's the first point. There's no answer to that. I just, I just wanted to get that off my chest. Um, I think it's a really important point that you raised, though, Jim, and I think that that that's been, you know, one of the key considerations for us because we didn't want to have unintended consequences where, you know, you've got social workers who are bringing, you know, their their their, um, you know, their their. Uh, stereotypic views with stereotypical views with them um, you know um and let's call it out you know who are, who are bringing aversive racism you know in 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 into the mix um focusing you know on 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 fat on, on on parenting capacity and on the family and not focusing on the eviction as creating you know the the, the vulnerability so it's really been you know it's, it's 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 taken a lot of work and that's why you know we have the you know we have the part a and the part b so we have the you know it, it may it may be the best advice is that you know you need to go because if you don't go then you know you are going to be arrested your trailer is going to be removed but you know so so that's why we you know we split into the part a and the part b but there will be times when the part b the full assessment will be initiated and i think this is where the pilot is going to be so important to understand how that's kind of being used on the, on on the ground floor but also i think um in terms of how we deliver training because we'll, we'll need to roll out training and how we use the tool so that we're absolutely clear that it's the eviction um that's the reason for the vulnerability and like i said i'm not i'm not you know casting the, a, a, an eye and bringing you know those those um you know views that some social workers bring into you know into assessments with um gypsies and travelers but it's a you know it's it's been a tricky one jim i have to say I think you're right, though. I think training's key, isn't it? Because, I mean, with my mental health hat on, I'm looking at the mental health section of the form thinking, you know, there's what a question on there. How often do you feel hopeless? That's a, that's a question that we use in mental health when, we, when we're worried about people harming themselves. And if they say, I feel hopeless all the time and I've got no pleasure in life, then that's a real risk factor. And, and you know, there is a risk of significant harm there. It's what you do with it then, isn't it? If it ends up on the form, you say, actually, if you do this, Mr. Policeman, there is going to be a risk of significant harm to this person and it's in writing on that form now so everybody's aware of that because that would be enough for me if there was somebody and, and i know there's issues with discussing mental health issues in the community i know that um, but if you can unpick that with your experience and knowledge and you get to the stage where you say i've actually got someone who here who is experiencing hopelessness to a significant degree which is leading me to think there's significant risk of harm to them then that's what you're going to be putting on that form that, and that will be the outcome so I think yeah I think you're right I think I think it's a good thing and I think it, it does and I mean Jackie went through all of the social work stuff that you learn in, in your social work degree isn't it and and that's you know embedded in our practice as social workers not so much probably in the other people that might be doing the assessments and that's where the training issue can I'm just one of the things I don't want to hog this <laughs> is uh, two questions have ADSS been involved and have the police been involved in development of this so far so they've not been 
involved in the development. It's our it's our tool. So we've developed it in in collaboration with Dan at MMU and and with Baswa. So it's very much our tool, and it's been developed by us as social workers who are of community. Um, but we have had discussions and we will continue to have discussions with the police. Um, I am in discussion with um, ADSS Cymru. I've got a meeting coming up next month with Jonathan specifically around, but we've had, we've, you know, we've had conversations leading up to the, the development and, and I've shared it, the early, the early um, drafts with Jonathan at ADSS Cymru, but absolutely targeting, you know, local government association, the, the, the association, of, association of directors and the police is, uh, there are key kind of priorities really. And this morning, my colleagues won't know yet because it was this morning whilst we were preparing, but um, we've had a lengthy conversation with the Department for Education um, who are really keen to look at whether or not this is something that they could adapt and share as a good practice guide. Um, that is a very, very initial conversation that happened this morning. It's going to need a lot more conversations between us as to whether or not we want to do that and whether or not that's helpful. Um, but certainly there are conversations at, at high levels with different organisations. Thanks, Chris. I can see that Trudy's got her hand up. Thanks, Ali. Um, yeah, I mean, really, I think it's a really um, brilliant bit of work. I think it's absolutely fantastic to have had this developed by you guys as a group from a community perspective and a professional perspective and that's just makes it such a different a different piece of guidance um and um you know i can see you know echo what other people have said in there about the strengths based and and and, and also the conversation you're just having now jim you see yourself and, and ali around you know mental health and you know one of my first thoughts was around like you know the reality of gathering all this information in the situation you know that we're talking about you know when when um a family are encamped and there's the potential you know of the police and bailiffs kind of being there but actually what you've just said jim in terms of gathering evidence around the impact on of of action on families is so important and it is what is missing most of the time um and i yeah i mean i think this is you know this is really important um, my concerns really, I mean, I'm, I'm Trudy from the Travelling Head Project in, in Wales and um, been working with, with um, Ali and, and others and Jan and others in, in coalition around issues about the um, impact of the uh, police bill as it was and now the police act is, and I think somebody's already said it in, in there, you know, that this was, is a great model for, for anybody carrying out um, a welfare inquiry and, and for me, there's just a massive disconnect between um, what is supposed to happen on the ground and what actually happens. So I think it's incredibly rare that you would have a social work practitioner out there doing this welfare assessment. Um, it's not consistent across Wales, I can't speak for England. Um, we have unauthorised encampment guidance, very out of date, needs updating, and this will be brilliant to be included in that, but completely inconsistent. And so whilst I think it's fantastic, how are we going to make sure that these welfare inquiries are being carried out by suitably trained people? How are we going to make sure that, you know, those feed into the decision making at a local at a local level. So, you know, it's several local authorities in Wales, the, the wealth, the response to an encampment and the welfare assessments are carried out by environmental health officers. You know, they, you know, yes, they might, I mean, and there are some we've got, you know, the kind of long-standing relationships with people who travel regularly through the area and might know those families quite well. And some of those relationships might be quite positive and, and some of them won't be, you know, but I mean, social worker never goes near that situation. The families are, you know, being kind of moved on or potentially agreed they can stay for a couple of days, but the, you know, the assessments taking place are not being done by, for example, social workers. And so for me, it's how we, how we ensure, and I know Jan and Neith Port Talbot, you've, you've already had conversations and you're ahead of the game here in, in terms of talking, uh, getting an agreement from the local authority about how um, uh, families who are traveling are, are responded to and supported, you know, when they're traveling through your local authority area. But, you know, for most local authorities, it, it, it's, you know, it's sidelined, you know, and, and it's like how we make sure that this good practice of this, this welfare inquiries are, are kind of being used um, in a way that's actually going to support 
families and 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 raise awareness of the needs and the situation of travelling families as they travel through through Wales, particularly with no transit sites and, and no options uh, for families to go to other than camp on land that doesn't belong to them. Um, I think that's one of my main concerns. I think the work is fantastic, but it's like what we do. And obviously, Ali and I, you know, we're talking about, you know, we're talking to ADSS, we're trying to get the police more on board in a joined up way. But, you know, the lead, Jim, is all coming from, from those of us in, in these other sectors. You know, it needs to be coming from the public bodies, you know, really understanding what these issues are. Um, and so, yeah. I'll, I'll shut up there but I think for me that those are some of the key areas and also the reality of like how fast these things are going to happen on the ground you know if there is an encampment and it's deemed to be causing issues by um pissed off local people who are not travelers and who just have a habit of complaining to their local elected members and to the police and about you know like how likely is it that you know this good practice is going to be able to kind of be there at that time when people might be you know, people are all just the threat of the new police powers is enough to make people move on. And that is also being used in that way at the moment. You know, there's not necessarily, I don't think I've heard in Wales yet that it's been used, but we've heard that the threat of it is being used. So it's like, you know, this is illegal now. And it's like, actually, this isn't illegal. <laughs> it's illegal if you're in camp without permission and it can be proven you've caused significant distress and disturbance, you know, um, but people are being moved on or are feeling they need to move on, even without any of these powers being enacted. So realistically, how you know, the processes need to address that as well as, you know, the uh, and family encamped for a period of days where you can go regularly and make a relationship with that family. That just might not be possible. So I think for me, that that's the other thing as well. Can you hear me, Alison? Yeah, yeah. Can I speak? Yeah, no, come on in. Hi, I'm Martin. Um, thanks, that true. That's really useful. I'm just trying to give a bit of a response rather than... Um, and just starting with what Trudy just said there, I think social workers have to complete these things, forms, don't want to say the A word, because we as a community are never going to understand and we're going to continue in another 50 years having the same discussions unless social workers, because social workers can't get, get out of jail by not completing certain tasks. And basically it's for it to be passed on to, envi you know, environmental health. You know, what are we? Rats. Um, it, it's just, that's just not, that's just not the way to go. And I know some local authorities do do that. And this is putting down a marker now that actually, it relates to the question, what do we like about it? Personally, I don't like anything about it. We should it's the fact that we created it's been created a vacuum so that actually it can um force more and more people to double up on sites, to treble up on sites, can't go on the road, can't be nomadic, just just create more and more and more problems to um demonize kids from the traveling communities. Um what are the challenges? Any new legislation, any new documentation, any new way of working brings numerous challenges across the board for everybody and anybody. And don't forget, you know, we, we need to build, uh, break down some of these barriers because basically the uh, relationships with any agencies, <laughs> never mind social workers, any agencies has been limited throughout society, throughout settled society. Um, and I just to finish to say, if we do good, if I suggest doing anything um, differently, I would encourage all practitioners, including social, especially social, to be imaginative and be creative. And they might be asked to do a certain piece of work to actually support a family, which they might not have done before. And actually, but that, as Jackie said, this might be the only opportunity for us to be heard, for us to have a conversation, including children especially children. So basically, I think there's real learning curve for everybody and all concerned. The good people listening to this and the people who have chosen not to be part of this, who need to be made aware that this is happening. Unfortunately, this law and this legislation has been put through, through the back door, and basically it's going to be acted on. It's already been acted on in England, so we need to be really on the ball with this. Thanks, Alison.
Uh, thank you, Martin. No, and, and, and all of those points that, that you raise in Trudy are, are, are you know, really important points. And I think, you know, unless we get that buy in at the most senior level, then then, you know, this 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 fantastic, you know, work, you know, will will, will be to no avail. And, you know, in Wales, as, as you know, as you know, we have the race equality action plan. So I think we have to link it into, you know, achieving, you know, the the, the you know, the outcomes in the in the race equality action plan, because, you know, we're never going to have, you know, a, an anti racist Wales by 2030, you know, if if a, you know, a welfare approach, you know, isn't taken to to, you know, an unauthorised encampment. So I think we've got to link it into that and, and get, you know, as you know, buy-in at the most at the most senior level but you know we're as you know but there's so few of us there's so few of us so so strategic partnership and support is absolutely you know absolutely key i, I can see that abby has got her hand up do you want to come in abby hi i, I don't mind if ian goes first because he's um had his hand up for a while oh sorry jan <laughs> you've had a, you have you had a longer hand do you want to come in jan Um, I was refusing to unmute then. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things for me, which is the part of the, the start of my journey in terms of um, um, champion gypsy traveller uh, rights and stuff, was I worked in one local authority where we were being sent out as social workers as part of an eviction tool. And when we were, we were asked to go out on one occasion where, where there was a large encampment where they were gathering together for, for a particular event. Um, we, we, we stood our ground and actually sort of raised our, our, our code of practice guidance uh, to, to actually stop that. And one of the interesting bits for, for, for me is I, I now work in a local authority that's um, a lot more um, responsive and actually taken on, on board quite a lot of the the points that we, we were raising as, as a working party in East Patalbert. Uh, initially, our environmental health team were, were the people who were going out and doing uh, roadside uh, 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 assessments. But then I was able to share the, the Welsh guidance, which uh, it goes back to 2013, that actually sort of says, well, it should actually be social workers to, to un undertake that piece of work. When I shared that with our legal department, our legal department have, have now made a, a specific, uh, um, uh, have made it very clear that any kind of roadside encampment has to go, come come through myself as the the, the, the the proactive social worker in this because I, I've got some degree of uh, cultural uh, awareness and, uh, and things. And I think strategically across Wales, we, we need to be getting the guidance, even though the, the, the Welsh guidance is um, you know nearly 10 years old and could be improved. If we had that actually shared with legal department, uh, legal departments in each local authority, as well as then, um, you know, w within that guidance, it actually ex expects social workers to have a certain degree of cult cultural awareness. And I think this is where Jim and Social Care Wheels can actually help promote that side of it. It it, it addresses some of those cultural, uh, the, those structural issues, because what I say time and time again, when it comes to gypsy travellers, is that there is legislation or there is guidance that's supposed to support them, but it's in some filing cabinets, in some darkened room that is in a building that was abandoned 35 million years ago. And a lot of it is actually just being able to pull those, those documents out and put them in front of the right people to, to, to support the, the thing. And I think there is also a piece of work that maybe needed to be done with, 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 with the courts around promoting this awareness as well. Yeah, thank you, Jan. Abby, do you want to come in now? Hello. Yes, just thank you, Alison and Jackie and Dan and Chris for that really helpful rundown and all your work to develop this. Um, I suppose just quickly, I suppose a couple of things. One thing that I like about what you've developed is it is a much more comprehensive and holistic look at what people's welfare needs are. And that there's a real focus on children as well, because you're so right that they're often overlooked in their experiences of eviction. Um, and quality, you are so right that quality welfare checks are so often absent and, and actually still not done quite a lot of the time. 
even here right on our patch in Brighton where we're based where we've done a lot of work with the council we know that they're still not doing them you know they see they see oh we've spoke to them before we don't need to do another welfare check you know um so it's really important that whole kind of comprehensive view the holistic approach that you've considered in your um good practice guide um what i suppose what, what one of the main challenges that was one of your questions i guess what worries me and trudy you've kind of covered this already really is the timing of this um the work that the speed at which police can engage these powers is it's so quick you know it can happen just in a matter of a few hours so i guess i'm just you know that that creates a real barrier in terms of like conducting any welfare assessment be it comprehensive or not so that is a kind of real worry um and the point that you made jackie you talked about building relationships you know quite often when we start working with people um, they might come to a group, you know, about, you know, it might be a particular activity or something. And it takes quite a bit of time to build that trust and relationship for all those other things to be opened up, for them to be talking about, you know, physical health, mental health. So it takes a bit. Of so timing again, if, if the power is being engaged, timing will be an issue. If you haven't got that relationship, these the answers to these questions won't be coming out. Um, but I think, I, I guess the other challenge, which we've also talked about already, is buy-in. So where there's pockets of good practice already, they are more, more likely to embrace this, you know, but they're already doing good things. Um, so it's how, how do we reach those other areas where, you know, the areas that really need to improve the situation. So you're, you know, the work that you're doing with the other statutory bodies that you mentioned, and the work with DFE, that'd be really interesting to see how that unfolds and how that can help. Um, I've got a ton of other notes here, but I think I'll just keep that as my sort of key points. Um, thank you. Thank you, Abby. I think um, speed is, 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 a, is a key one, isn't it? Um, but I think, you know, one of the reasons that that we would like to see, you know, under the Police Act, these these welfare inquiries completed by social workers, you know, social workers are are, are really skilled at, at you know conversations in in in, in within short time frames. Um, I, was, I was thinking about um, one of one of the families I think that you were supporting uh, in travelling ahead, Trudy. They had an intervention by. Um, uh, 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 therapeutic social workers in 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 Wales, and they didn't necessarily have any understanding of of, of community, and who didn't know about their levels of, of cultural competence. But what they brought were they they brought their values, they brought their their family focus, they brought anti racist approaches, and they really engaged fantastically with their families. It was their social work skills. Um, so, you know, that's a reason in terms of, you know, th those kind of really highly pressured, you know, circumstances, we want social workers there undertaking, you know, those, those, those inquiries. Um, and I think, you know, when a social worker is there and saying, I need to undertake a, a welfare inquiry, I think that, you know, again, that should be a reason for slowing things down. Because even when social workers are dealing with, you know, really serious, you know, child protection uh, assessments, they slow things down. Good social workers slow things down. So we hope, again, it will be that part of that, that, that brokerage, you know, between the person undertaking the inquiry and the police will be, we need to slow things down for us to undertake um, these, these inquiries. Thanks. The, the, the also point that, that Chris helped us um, navigate and um, highlight, I think, given the pace um, and not wanting to run families into additional conflict, is that the information, particularly that create uh, collected through Part B, where it's sensitive and appropriate to do so, could be used in evidence for judicial review yeah. um, at a later date. And so still the principle of natural justice um, is being pursued in recognition of all of the existing or uh, those intersection challenges that exist too. Thanks, Dan. I can see Adrian's got his hand up. 
Hi, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, when you did all the introductions at the beginning, I had to go out and take a call, so I missed most of that. Um, I'm Adrian Jones, I'm Policy Officer at Derbyshire Gypsy Liaison Group, um, Policy Hub at Moving for Change. Um, I think this the form you proposed to use looks brilliant. Um, one thing that sort of struck me is the people, social workers talking about going out doing assessments or inquiries, and I'm thinking, blimey, social workers go out and do this? Because in a lot of councils, that's just not the case. I know Martin mentioned treating people as rats. Um, until very recently in Wolverhampton, uh, unauthorised encampments came under environmental crime. So, um, and I was just making a note of councils I know where the assessments are carried out by housing, community engagement, environmental health, public health. So I think the form you've come up with, I'm just thinking this is a wonderful model, a wonderful thing that councils can use. But it is, I think Abby says, well, it's getting this out to the relevant sections within councils. I don't know where it might be useful to go through someone like the LGA, uh, municipal journal, somewhere to raise the awareness, because it isn't just like hitting social workers or housing staff. It varies so much across different councils. Yeah, no, no, you're, you're completely right, Adrian. And I think, um, you know, we were very aware that um, probably social workers will be in the minority in undertaking, you know, these, these inquiries. So we developed the form so that it can be used by whoever. But again, it's really critical that that everyone has that 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 training because you know what like I said what we don't want we don't want those unintended unintended consequences and that's why particularly if it's you know if, it, if it's a full well, welfare inquiry that's where we think you know social workers really should be you know undertaking them and it's this is you know this is going to be a job of work in 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 you know making sure that that you know we're 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 spreading, you know, the the word, and and that our our collaborations are with, you know, key stakeholders who can ensure that that this is, you know, this is the model that that's used. But it's 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 gonna it's good, it's really going to be a job of work. Just very brief in response, and, and certainly I know the moving for change would be out the. We just been a little couple of us have been having a bit of a com conversation on this. We'd be happy to promote this. I'm sure, uh, you know, across the different councils we work with, because I think this is um, some kind of standardisation be very useful and more in, yeah. more information in a more sensitive way, bet basically be better inquiries or assessments, whatever you want to call them. Um, I think this would be great. Yeah, really, no, that really, really positive thing. Thank you. I no, really appreciate that. The, the Gypsy Roma Traveller Social Workers, we, we are network members of um, Moving for Change and I've got an um, email from Debbie. So we've got um, we've got a meeting that we're going to set up to talk yeah, about. I've just been chatting with her as well. <laughs> this is brilliant. Hello, yeah, Debbie. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Chris, you've got your hand up. Um, Trudy had her hand up first. So I'm going to let Trudy go first. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, I, I think I made the point in the chat earlier, but just just thinking on, you know, talking about buy-in and getting getting it out to people who need to be using it. I mean, in, in Wales, you know, the as Jan, you were saying, the unauthorised encampment guidance or managing unauthorised encampment guidance, it's called, is from 2013. You know, it's been on the list for Welsh Government to update it for the last five years while we've been waiting for the... Um, changes to the UK legislation. Um, obviously, we've got that now. That's in the Race Equality Action Plan. I mean, getting this guidance into that um, uh, guidance for all local authorities in Wales on um, managing unauthorised encampments. You know, I don't know if they can, might change that wording. Um, I think that that's a really that's a really key opportunity there, really. Um, and that would mean then, you know, that requires local authorities to have protocols to have a, um, a, um, a spock or whatever the word is to have a kind of um, specific person or specific kind of point of contact who actually goes out and does those um, um, assessments and engages with traveling families. Having said that, it's not well monitored, it's not well implemented and there's been very little accountability for whether those things are set up but what we'd like to see under the Race Equality Action Plan is that the new guidance, you know, includes things like like this, this really great welfare assessment kind of template and is much clearer on what local authorities need to be doing. Because, of course, in Wales, we've also got this duty to provide 
not just to assess, but to provide sites, including um, assess and provide transit provision, which could include permanent transit provision, or it could include, you know, negotiated stopping. Um, the unauthorised encampment guidance already talks about that. But local authorities are, mo many local authorities are not, you know, um, working under that guidance now. But that for me is a real opportunity to kind of get this sort of in place across Wales. And as you say, Adrian, with the Welsh Local Government Association as well. But effectively, I think through that guidance and really getting some accountability from Welsh Government um, on those local authorities are actually delivering that in a quality way. Um, and I also think the fact that social workers and others um, uh, carrying out these welfare assessments, you know, that understanding that that there is this duty there and actually advocating to the local authority about kind of this is your duty in Wales. And I, you know, I know there's other duties in England, but a very specific duty in Wales, which has not been met. But effectively, if there were transit sites in Wales or there were pieces of land that were regularly used for negotiated stopping that had already been kind of identified by local authorities, families would not, well, families would have options. Yeah, they may not want to go there. They may not want to be sent there by the police or anybody else, but there would be options. And at the moment, despite the legal duty, there are still no options for families any different than in, in England, despite there being this positive duty. So I think social workers and the tra and anybody else using this guidance and the training that goes with that really needs to, you know, this could create another um, a really, really important um, cohort of advocates, as, as you were saying, Jackie, you know, for, for, for the facilitation of the nomadic way of life full stop, which we're supposed to have in Wales, but we don't have. And, and that's what I'd like to see, you know, that it pulls together all of that, really, as well as protecting families from the, the worst of the police, the new police powers. No, thank you, Trudy. And I think, I suppose, you know, my best hope is that, you know, we've got more of an open door in Wales. You know, you, we've both been involved through the Wales Coalition with, you know, with, with, with the inquiry that that's, you know, been open in, in you know, in, in Wales. Um, so I'm hoping but you know, we, we know even with the duty, even with the statutory duty, you know, no, n you know, there's been no account accountability and no changes happen, but um, we just have to keep on, don't we? We have to keep on advocating. We have to keep on pressing and using all those levers that we've got. And I think, you know, at the moment, you know, with the inquiry, with the race equality action plan, with the statutory duty, you know, we have some powerful levers, hopefully in Wales, to get this, you know, embedded as 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 the the tool that that's used with the accountability that goes. And as you said, let's get some more. Let's get got some more advocates, some more social work advocates. It would be absolutely brilliant. Chris, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I guess I just wanted to come back to the issue around speed. Um, so in, in Wiltshire, we're exploring this. And I think the reality is it comes down to training a broader group of people to have that awareness and that understanding. So whilst particularly the part B, we really would want social workers to take the lead on, actually, we know that a wide range of different people are doing those um, those welfare checks, those welfare inquiries that and have previously been doing them. And um, I think what's really interesting for me in Wiltshire is when we've we've had initial conversations about trying to pilot this, um, our highways enforcement team, which are the, the team that particularly work in this area at the moment in Wiltshire and how they've chosen to, to do it they've been really reacting positively to this. For them, there's a sense in which they feel like they've been doing brokerage between um, nomadic communities, landowners, um, councillors who are receiving complaints and, and trying to balance those different interests and then working alongside police colleagues. So actually having an evidence-based approach for them, they're saying is really refreshing and is really helpful. So whilst in terms of do they get all the nuances of how to get that information, to collect that information and maybe understand fully how to do it? No, of course they don't. But there's still going to be a significant improvement on what's been there before. And that's without us having to address the issues around social work and others. Um, 
that is something that I think will come and, and we can continue to push those discussions. Certainly in Wiltshire, the, there's a receptiveness to that, that discussion. But I think in the short term, I think pieces of training with key people doing that work um, is still going to produce a lot better results than we've got currently. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Do you, do you want to say a little bit about the potential pilot in Wiltshire? Yeah, no, I can do. So I think we're still trying to get final um, sign off. Um, but at the moment, the um, we have a really positive response. So um, I chair the Traveller Reference Group within Wiltshire Council, which brings all the different um, areas of the council that link around Gypsy Roma Traveller um, together. And at the moment, this has been one of the areas of work that we've been really keen to do something around. We've um, done some research around what we felt the impact would be in Wiltshire on um, on families through this legislation and how could we manage that. We're also aware in Wiltshire we've got a slightly unusual circumstance that there's a particular aspect of the legislation where um, people coming for solstice potentially are going to be impacted by the length of time that they are required not to return to a site. Um, and for us, that presents some interesting challenges as having people come twice a year um, to come and culturally or religiously engage is potentially going to be um, prevented by the law. Um, so we're trying to be creative in it. We certainly haven't got everything all set up or well. I'm not, I wouldn't want to highlight Wiltshire as being a particularly um, brilliant example of practice, but I think the heart, the the direction that senior leaders want to take it in is helping. Um, the plan that, that we've been exploring is doing a six month pilot around this, and it also coincides with the a discussion that we're having around negotiated stopping and around um, some transit sites that had previously been agreed and that seemed to be taking forever to come through the uh, planning and other processes. And that when we put those together, that would give us a potential to give a much better service to our nomadic communities in Wiltshire. And that hopefully at the end of the six months, we'd be able to evaluate that that was significantly worth the resource. I think the key in the discussions I've had is that in many ways, this is cost neutral. Um, you know, the, these assessments are already supposed to be being done. So we're not, we're not asking the council to employ anyone new to do anything. There's a debate about which team exactly holds responsibility for what. And, and, and I can see in the reality of the discussions I'm having with the council that certainly the part A is unlikely to be done by social workers. And I fully accept that. Yeah. Um, but actually, the reality is there's a legal duty, so it doesn't make any difference whether or not we want to argue about the costings of this particular model or another model of doing a welfare check. It still needs to be done. I think there's a recognition um, for us, both in the local authority and from our police colleagues, that it's uh, something that's difficult for the police to do well whilst also trying to enforce the law. They've been really clear they didn't want the legislation, their submissions to the Home Office were very clear, they didn't need the legislation, um, but now they've been given it, they're in a, an awkward position as to how they manage that. And so by having someone neutral, be it the local authority, be it, um, so for example, we've, we've got an incredibly positive relationship with a Gypsy Roma Traveller chaplain in, in Wiltshire called Jonathan Herbert, um, or Julian House, who we commissioned to do a lot of work with our um, nomadic communities across Wiltshire, Baines and um, Somerset and Bristol and Bath. I think there's real opportunities for those kind of people to be involved as well as our highways team and I think it's about creating that. We also know and I think most local authorities know that there are particular times of year and there are particular locations that are much more likely to see um, see these unauthorized encampments and so i think that allows by using that research by using that data you can actually look at well okay who do we need to train who is in that area 
that therefore that quick response within a few hours um, is much easier to happen. Um, so I think it's still very early days. We still need to go through cabinet process um, around this for our end, but um, certainly at a director level, we've got a lot of support. Thank you, Chris. Um, and in Wales, Gypsy Traveller Wales um, have a contract to undertake the welfare inquiries in Cardiff and in Gwent. And it, I'm pretty certain that there will be a, 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 a pilot site for, we've already started the conversations about them being a, a pilot site for us in Wales. And I've got a, a meeting with Jasmine, the manager, in the next couple of weeks to start looking at how we how we begin to undertake the pilot in Wales. And I'm, and I'm hoping, is, is Jan still on? I'm hoping that that Neath Patalbert, particularly as you know, all of those inquiries will be funneled through Neath Patalbert because of Jan's particular role there, that Neath Patalbert can potentially be a, a pilot site for us as well. Well, discussions are underway and uh... A positive uh, voices are coming back at the moment, so but it's Fab. early days. Fab, thank you, because it's really important that we get pilot sites across England and Wales, just to see, you know, if there are differences in 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 the the way that the um, assessments are being the, the inquiries are being undertaken, and particularly there, you know, there are there, there's there's a different approach, you know. In Wales, there is absolutely, you know, a, a welfare approach to um, unauthorised encampments under the police bill, and it's, it's there's a mixed picture across England, isn't there? There are, you know, there are some authorities where it's police, you know, police forces where they want to take a, a welfare approach, and then others where, you know, it's a it's it's an enforcement approach. So really important that we get, you know, England and Wales pilot sites to evaluate. Dan, I can see you've got your hand up there. Yes, thanks. Um, I just just wanted to say that the um, the, the way that we've 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 amalgamated those important uh, pieces of legislation um, has has some degree of precedent. And Martin Norton and I have um, used a sort of, a sort of hybrid uh, approach to to consider key aspects of the Children Act, the Mental Health Act, and the Care Act in um, cases where we've gone to the Royal Courts of Justice to appeal eviction and the uh, certain imprisonment of people for breaching uh, planning law. Um, some of those cases, the appeals have been successful and others haven't. But there is a degree of precedent, and I think we've developed that in this form. Um, the other thing that we're aware of is that it being a paper form, that, that it may be very difficult or more difficult. As, as systems have moved to, to electronic and to, to, to capture use, particularly. Where it's highlighting opportunities to challenge action uh, under um, the legislation that we've included, specifically human rights. So there are conversations um, happening to think about how we could turn this into um, an app that maybe families who might not feel comfortable speaking to uh, a social worker or a designated person uh, about some of the challenges that the act of uh, action may cause could enter that information themselves into an app and that app through a process of um, uh, things that are a bit more clever than me can formulate that into a document that can be used to petition or peer uh, actions too. And so that, that works um, I thought, but as, as Alison said, there's, there's a lot of work to do. You know, so that any, any support, advice, guidance would be absolutely uh, welcome. My screen just went really weird. Sorry, I think I was buffering then. Um, I just wanted to say that we've got Mark Watson here from, from the police who works with Jeanette McCormack. She was hoping to come today, but emailed us to say that she wasn't able to. But we do have, uh, we are looking to set up a, a meeting directly with her so that we can talk to her about our, I know, our guidance and, and inquiry approach. Um, but thanks to Mark for coming along today. Are there any more? I could, Trudy has popped something into the chat to say that she 
she can think of another pilot site in Wales. Brilliant. <laughs> we'll have a chat about that after the after the event. Um, can I can I just add a bit of thingy to this, Ella? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Come on, Mark. Yeah, yeah I'm just I'm just thinking. Um, just came to me as as uh, Dan was talking there. Um, who's to say in three, six, twelve months, eighteen months time, two years time, families that are on the roadside are under pressure. Word of mouth is get a social worker to do one of those assessments and actually it'll be in our best interests. Yeah. That's what could actually, what I'm saying is it's demystifying the the relationship, the, the perception of social workers, that social workers can help and assist people. And actually it's demystifying the perception of tra gypsy traveling communities to social workers that actually... They're, they're out there, they're, they're doing this, and actually they're not passing it on to environment health, environmental health to do any longer. They're not passing it on to some somebody else who's not actually got a duty or responsibility like they have to do it in the first place. I'm just trying to show a bit of vision here that actually it is an unknown territory for all of us, and we're quite apprehensive and quite scared as to what the outcomes and how it will be perceived by certain police authorities. Um, and local authorities um, but actually I'm just trying to be a bit sort of who's to say that actually you know we got a social a word will spread word will spread we got a social worker and they were able to slow down the eviction they were able to actually assist in where we might be able to identify a whole insight so you know there's loads of permutations that actually could come from this I'm trying to be constructive and positive mm -hmm. Despite the the apprehension, the fear is palatable. It's actually frightening, as Jackie said. You know, the mental health needs of our families and communities are massive. I'll show them. No, thank you, Martin. Yeah, thank you. Wouldn't it be fantastic? That's best hopes, isn't it? Best hopes that community would say, "I need a social worker because they do great stuff for us." So um, yeah, no, brilliant, thank you. And that, and that was, I think Abby, Abby's put um, something in the chat. Uh, good point, Martin. Understandable fear of social workers, but and and that and that's why we set up the Gypsy Roman Traveller Social Work Association. That was, you know, that was one of the kind of reasons that um, you know we set up was to try and change the way that social work happens with our communities and our families. Um, I, just um, Narinda's just let me know that we've got Kish Batty Sinclair here from Social Work Education Anti Racist Network um, who's offering support. Kish, are, are you happy to open up your camera and? <laughs> so sorry, so, I was just fiddling <laughs> with that. <laughs> Hello, nice to see you. We met at Jay's work. It's lovely. Yeah. Really lovely to see you uh, I know again. I came to your session. I was really um, very enthused by the work you're doing in Wales, uh, and it's a great example of amazing practice uh, with a you know, very particular group of um, uh, what we, you know, in social work we call people who who you know need, I suppose, additional services, you know, over and above what is normally required, and. Um, so I'm coordinating the anti-racist social work education group, network it is, um, and we really welcome um, colleagues who are here to join us to promote across the four countries of the UK, the work you're doing in Wales, um, because there are, uh, we've got something like 76 people um, and mostly academics, but then we can reach, we, we can reach students, can't we, through academics. Um, most of them are leading um, programs and so one of the things I'm going to do uh, because I teach uh, four or five modules is to make sure that in each module I integrate the work you're doing and that is a way of cascading the good practice that you're talking about here so yeah anything I can do to push out your um, but actually join us get, send me an email and I'll add you to our list of people who are members of SWERN we're working with BASWA Social Work England um, and through Scotland and Northern Ireland, their regulators as well. So we do have a bit of a reach in terms of 
just because we happen to be leading on social work programs. But thank you so much for inviting me. Narinda invited me, and we, I met you both at JSPEC. It was lovely. Um, anything I can do, please come back to me. Uh, yeah, I'll no, put thank my email you. address. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's really great to see you. I mean, the Gypsy Roma Traveller Social Work Association is 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 for nation, which is fantastic. Um, so uh, yeah, we would. Yeah, yeah no, we, we'll 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 be in touch. We'll be in touch. Um, Trudy, yeah, I can see. Do. Yeah, we will do. Trudy, I can see you've got your hand up. Yeah, just just quickly, just to uh, say. Um, uh, uh, Martin, your your point. I think I I really hope that that will be one of the things that happens. I think there are opportunities in this really threatening sort of times for people to um, be identified differently as allies and champions and and advocates. And and I and I I can see from my experience of supporting families that you know absolutely if it becomes known that you know a social work assessment is a good thing can help identify a stopping place can help make sure people don't just get moved on can help people access their rights or legal representation then you know that could well be one of the one of the outcomes and and i and i hope it is i'd put a quote um a little comment a, a bit earlier in that our advocacy services actually had several referrals anonymously from social workers because they are seeing what is happening in their local authorities but they do not feel empowered to make that referral in a um, open way because their local authorities are you know making decisions that they don't agree with and presumably they feel they wouldn't be supported by their managers either um, and uh, you know obviously we're, we're really glad that you know people are making those referrals and and um and making sure families are aware of advocacy support that we can offer but you know what we want to see is you know practitioners shouldn't be shouldn't yeah. be in that position they should be clearly stating you know this is what people's rights are these processes are you know are important necessary um to promote people's well-being and to safeguard people and to promote their rights and you know should have the space and the the confidence to do that so I really hope that does start changing because um, all the all the contacts we've had about encampment issues from a local authority have been in a kind of back doorway because people don't feel confident to do that, which is appalling. You know, and yeah. Wales likes to think of itself as having this you know great approach, and um, you know that isn't the case across across the board. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to check on or just ask was some. Um, Chris, I know uh, Chris Johnson. I know you're you're on the on the call, and you you wrote the forward. And um, I was just thinking about could you or somebody say a little bit more about what we think in terms of like possible legal cases that might that might um, uh, be possible to take. You know, like if guidance hasn't been followed. You know, obviously this guidance um, the the group have have developed isn't isn't statutory guidance at this point so like how do we use it you know like and you know if you could just say a little bit about how one obviously we've got a task to kind of get it into kind of processes so that it does become you know either statutory or, or certainly informal guidance but you know how 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 does the kind of welfare assessments fit with or, or affect the kind of legal, you know, so for example, if, if there are no welfare assessments done, you know, is that a um, basis for a legal challenge, do you think? Would you be able to say a little bit more about how the two things kind of interact? Well, um, apologies for having my video off. I've been, I've had to multitask in the background, so I didn't want you all to watch me type in like a loony. Um, the, and thanks, uh, for inviting me and excellent guidance, uh, absolutely marvellous. And um, uh, yeah, in answer to that question, uh, uh, welfare inquiries are not carried out in 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 terms of guidance. Then uh, that's a significant potential challenge. Um, this is not statutory guidance, but as has been mentioned, I have been listening uh, as as well as multitasking. And uh, as has been mentioned. Um, the hope is that local authorities throughout England and Wales will either adopt this or use this uh, guidance because it is such a, a great uh, model of, of, of good guidance. I'd like to just mention two things on challenges. Um, there's a Romney uh, woman who's, who has to resort to unauthorised encampments and an Irish traveller woman 
as well, also un unauthorized encampments who are, we're attempting to get legal aid for them to actually challenge the law itself. Now, firstly, that's going to be a long haul challenge. Obviously, the government are not going to roll over. Um, but we are making that attempt and we're very happy for any other gypsies and travelers who would like to talk to us about that to contact us on that question. Uh, the more the merrier really. And then there are specific challenges. So to eviction situations using the new offense, well, using, using any of the existing powers, but certainly using the new offense that's been created. And one important point there, I think, is that um, as has been mentioned on timing, if the deadline arrives, then, uh, and, and the deadlines can of course be very short, even if it's felt by social workers involved, other advisors involved, solicitors involved, that it's not being done correctly. Uh, the gypsies and travellers are going to go because they don't want to obviously be arrested and have their homes impounded, which is the possible consequence. Um, but given how draconian um, this new offence is, we are very interested in looking at whether challenges can be made perhaps because of failure to follow this guidance, to failure to take account of welfare considerations, et cetera, after the eviction has taken place. It's already been mentioned that um, you're going to be banned from a, a piece of land if, if the notice is served for a year. Um, very bizarre point in all this is that, that the amendment to Section 62A which is where people are sent to normally a transit pitch or, or directed rather to a transit pitch. Um, a transit pitch is only available for three months, but the ban on the whole local authority area in terms of section 62A is 12 months. So effectively, even if you, so to speak, do what you're told, you're still gonna be banned for nine months from once you have to leave the transit pitch. So these are all big challenges that we hope some of these can be brought forward, even if the eviction has taken place. Thank you, Chris, that's, that's really helpful. Thank you. And thank you for all of your support in reviewing the guidance and writing the forward for us. I think we've got, I'll, I'll just have a look at um, any more questions in the, in the chat. That we might have missed and I think we need to summarize and call the meeting to a close. I th think there was one in particular on intersectionality. So Sarah's written, if it's not there already, I feel it would be really beneficial to see intersectionality explicitly included in the undertaking a good inquiry part. Too often overlapping social identities are viewed and worked in silos, which leaves people open to further marginalization and ineffective support planning. Often issues where non-engagement with support planning and identified goals is noted, it comes down to the fact that the intersection of two or more social identities, protected characteristics, have created a hidden barrier that cannot be resolved by viewing each element separately. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, having an intersectional lens was very much uh, to the fore when we were we were developing um, this practice guidance. Adrian's got, is that a legacy hand, Adrian, or is it a new one? Oh, it's, it's a real hand. I, I was just typing it in. Uh, it's just a point uh, to, to what Chris said about um, the situation with, um, you know, being given three months to stay in a transit site, then being kicked out for a year. Actually, it's often far worse than that because a lot of transit sites, the stay is 28 days. So it isn't even necessarily three months. Thanks, Adrian. It's just, it's just a bomb. It's an abomination, isn't it? It's a complete abomination. Can I just clarify something there, Alison? That, that, that that's absolutely correct, Adrian. But the government guidance is that it should be three months. But uh, but yes, uh, councils like Wolverhampton, it's not three months. But uh, then it's not in compliance with the government guidance. Thank you. Um, I don't see any more questions. So Dan, would you like to? Call us to a close. Yeah, of course. Thank you. It's a great honour. Um, thanks everybody for attending. Um, clearly, um, 
we recognise that it's high kick. Re recognise this is really important work, and thank you for your support. Um, we recognise the inherent tensions of um, highlighting best practice to conduct welfare inquiries, and and the need to recognise how police action is exacerbating the challenges that families might be living with. Against them, um, bringing families straight into the to the attention of multi-agency safeguarding hubs. So we, we're continually uh, aware of that tension and continue to manage it. In addition then to the, the conversations that have been had around social work practice as an organisation, the Gypsy Roma Travel Association continue to push for and lobby for better practice, better pro-Gypsy Roma Travel practice, practice that is Gypsy Roma Traveller centred and we're starting to see positive movement, but there's still lots of work to be done. Um, and, and the fear and suspicion um, that we're aware of and that, that, that is being reported is, is a clear ambition of ours. I think using our position and power and legal duties as social workers to ensure that the letter and the spirit of the principles that are being set to make the lives of families harder um, 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 can be challenged. Um, sits squarely as a professional um, um, value and priority. So it's important that the community see we as an organisation, as the Digital Roma Travel Social Work Association, uh, are developing those pro uh, Gypsy Roma Traveller perspectives too. Given where we are in terms of the timing of this work, um, we hope that um, we can continue to support the rollout of this through the various different pilot sites that have been uh, discussed. And we'll be keeping in close communication with all of you in terms of the decisions that are made and ongoing use of, of, of guidance, including any reviews that may need to be made in relation to the feedback that we get. Um, in relation to each document, the good practice guidance part A and part B, there's a QR code on all of those forms that enable people who are using that document, including families, to give us feedback on, on how useful the form has been, any problems with the form or how the form could be different. And you, of course, are all welcome to contribute to that discussion too. But I think it's incredibly important and we're incredibly proud to be involved in the development of this good practice guidance, at the same time recognising the tragic need for it. Um, but um, its development, of course, uh, is only as important as its implementation. And we look to all of you and to all of our other uh, partners to help us achieve that. Thanks so much for your time. If there's any other questions or if you want to meet us uh, individually as an organisation to talk about the work that we're doing, not just in terms of the good practice guidance, but in terms of driving a better social work practice, then please do get in touch. Thank you, Dan. And um, in terms of next steps for us, it's to keep up that kind of pressure and 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 that kind of influence so that we get this as, as, as the standardised tool that's used. But uh, also uh, in, pra in pragmatic terms, it's, it, it's to get those pilot areas, you know, confirmed and those, those, those pilots up and running. So we, we'll have um, hopefully in a few weeks, a few months time, we'll, we'll, we can organise another, you know, another round table and we'll, we'll have some feedback on, on, on actual implementation of, of the uh, good practice guidance. So uh, I hope you all have a great rest of the day and look forward to catching up with you, Adrian, and, and moving for change and yeah. uh, with Jeanette McCormack yes. in, the, in, in the police as well. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.